Welcome to another episode of the ANSA podcast. I'm your host, Captain Manuel Calo. Today, we're honored to have a special guest, Commander Rolando Machado Jr., Vice President of the Association of Naval Officers, Service Officers, or ANSO. Before we dive into uh, the conversation, a quick disclaimer. The views expressed in this podcast are those of the participants and do not reflect the official policy or, posi or position of the Department of Defense, the Department of the Navy, or any other government agency. This episode is proudly uh, sponsored by Navy Mutual, providing financial security and peace of mind of four members of the military and their families. We are, we are also excited to remind you about the upcoming Western Region Leadership Symposium, hosted by, by ANSO from December the 2nd through the 6th, 2024 at MCAS Miramar in San Diego, California. It is a incredible opportunity for professional development, networking, and engaging with industry leaders. Visit ansomil.org for more details. Now let's get started, sir. How are you doing today? Welcome. Like this is this is great because like now I, I always do this through Zoom like virtual, but now this is my second time I have somebody face to face. So how are you doing today, sir? I'm I'm doing great, Manuel. Uh and let me say thank you for everything that you're doing with these podcasts. It's been really fun to watch them. Yeah. Um and really inspiring, but but I also appreciate you opening up your home mm -hmm. and allowing me to to join you today to to have what I think is a, a great conversation. Yeah, yes, sir. So most definitely, we want to more uh, we want to know more about who's Lieutenant Commander Machado, like what his roles uh, in the ANSA community, more about uh, what who, what's your background, what you can offer as a network for people that listen here, especially for those that are looking forward to to get more insights about even the Navy or as a armed, uh, armed forces as a whole. So let's start from the beginning. So, so for the audience, who is Rolando Machado? So you, can you give us that uh, background? Yeah, so uh, Rolando Machado is uh, a visionary leader mm -hmm. uh, who seeks to build other leaders. And uh, other leaders of character and make a difference in the world. Um, I was born and raised in Miami. Okay. Uh, my parents are Cuban. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I have a very interesting perspective because my mom's side of the family was upper middle class in Cuba. Okay. My dad's side was more rural. Um, and so the perception uh has has normally been that you know uh the communist revolution was helpful for one group of people mm, okay. uh but in reality at least in my ex experience right mm. you could be upper middle class or you could be you know kind of lower class and it yeah, didn't help them it was affecting by by both it doesn't matter right. like what type of class you were either upper or middle or low it was affected to everyone, and we right. can see that through the history, right? Exactly, and you know, very similar uh, to one of one of the earlier podcasts you had with Melanie. Mm. Um, she talked about her time uh, in North Korea with defectors, right? Yep. And or well, with the North Korean defectors when she was in South Korea. But that sentiment, right? That sentiment permeates a lot of, you know, the Hispanic community in mm. the United States. Mm right? The, the need to leave your country where you grew up, you know, and completely start anew somewhere right. else. Right. Um, and so that's, that's one uniting force, I think, that, that Hispanics have within, within the United States. We may be coming from one country with political turmoil, another country with economic turmoil, but at the end of the day, you know, we unite here, hopefully, um, and, and try to make our lives better, make our families' lives better, mm -hmm. and really advance things for right. for the future no it, it, it's like awesome to hear this side of the story right because like your family were on the revolution right back in cuba right so they they experienced what what happened back then so therefore it, it forced them to actually come to uh united states right so that's why you come in place so go thinking back uh, when you were when you were growing in miami so uh, who, who was Rolando machado like going through high school and going through your know, middle school like uh you, do you have like any issues with the language or not because like now you were fully english or oh you maintain your spanish can you talk about that experiences yeah so uh i grew up speaking spanish mm -hmm. um but then 
like as I got into elementary, middle school, I kind of stopped speaking as much. Mm. And so um, what I actually ended up realizing is I, I was losing a language that I really wanted to have. And so I ended up working somewhere where I needed to kind of refine my Spanish skills. And so I, I did that. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think the defining moment during my high school time frame was actually my freshman year of high school. Uh, it was the day of the class president's speech. Mm-hmm. And I was in the runoff election for class president. Oh, okay. And so it was me and another person. And around 8 a.m., uh, we delivered our speech. Um, we get back to homeroom and, uh, it was September 11th, 2001. Oh, okay. And so, uh, that moment I really kind of began to actually realize, Hey, military service and defending this nation is probably something I really want. Mm. Um, I remember, uh, one of the guys that was in the football team, he was over my shoulder and he said to me, Hey, Machado, what, what would, what would you do if you were president? Mm. And I was like, I'd, I'd kill them all. Mm-hmm. Right. Like I'd kill all those terrorists right. because they just attacked Home- America. Yeah. Right. And, and, and they attacked a lot of innocent people mm-hmm. that were not fighting them. Right. That's a very cowardly thing to do. And so I felt, I felt like, I have an obligation to serve. And so that was when I really first got that taste of, of a desire to be in the military. Yeah. And then that's a, the greatest, I mean, not so great a moment in the United States in the history. And I think that triggers a lot of our service members to join the military, the armed forces. And I, I can see based on your story, uh, history that uh, actually prompts you to say like, Hey, I need to do something because like they came to our house and they, that's, that's not fair. Right. Cause like there's a lot of innocence that they got involved in the situation. So now that triggers you to actually start thinking about the military. Now you didn't have any, uh, parents or any family on the military, right? So how you started now to actually start like, hey, uh, I want to join the, the army perhaps, or do I want to join the Marines or the Navy in this case? So can you talk about that, how you started to, to research? In yeah, that? so um, so at that moment, you know, I had that sense of deep obligation. You know, my family came here from Cuba. Mm-hmm. Freedom is important. I need to defend it, mm-hmm. right? And so that that was a triggering moment. Um, and so what I started to do was I started to find out what is the military, right? What, mm-hmm. what, you know, mm-hmm. what's it about? Um, I knew I wanted to go to college, so I started looking up information about um, engineering schools that had, you know, military service. And I found out about the service academies. Mm-hmm. So I found out about the okay. Air Force Academy gotcha. and the Naval Academy. Got it. And that was freshman year. Mm -hmm. Um, And so once I found out about that, I was kind of early on leading heavily toward Air Force. Um, And then I visited the Naval Academy as a sophomore. I came up to D.C. for um, a leadership program. And while I was up here, um, up in D.C., I I decided to travel a little bit to Annapolis, which is where the Naval Academy is. Mm -hmm. And it was a very, very cold day in January. There's snow on the ground. I'm a kid from Miami mm-hmm. and I'm <laughs> like seeing like different, like completely, completely different, different completely but different I experience. still, I felt this sense of, of belonging. I felt right. like a sense of this is, this is home. I feel comfortable mm-hmm. here, mm-hmm. even though this is like completely out of my element. Gotcha. Um, so that was really my first, my first take on that. I started reading about what, what it, what you needed to do to be competitive. Mm. Um, you know, you need a nomination from either a Senator or a Congressman. Okay. Um, and it was, you know, you needed high SAT scores, which I struggled with during, during high school. So I had to get extra tutoring. Right. So all those things were things that I, I found out about and, and I, I really said, okay, this is something I want. How do I accomplish it? And I kind of just went through, um, the process to try and make myself as competitive as I could to get an offer to go to a service academy. 
And then do you feel any like uh, challenges of being a Hispanic in this process? Like when you start to, to start competing and trying to get the letter from the senators and to build in the packet, do you feel any difference or is it like okay for you? I think I think with where I was, it it wasn't that that much of a problem. Mm -hmm. Um because I was in Miami and, and the mm -hmm. majority of Miami is Hispanic. Hispanic, yes. My congressman, um, I was nominated by uh, Congressman Mario Diaz Balart, okay. who uh, still represents that district today. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, you know, I was I was lucky mm -hmm. uh, in the sense that that you know I was given an opportunity and and you know I I did my best. I think the the more challenging thing about being Hispanic was actually when I showed up to the academy. Okay, so that's so, the next step. So now, uh, and I think that we're going to get to that conversation now. So you got the packet. You got accepted to the Naval Academy uh, after high school. So so then, how was that experience to you? Like, now this kid from Miami, you know, like, all he knows is, Dímelo, que bola, que bola. Right, que bola. Que bola. A serie. A serie, a serie, que bola. Vamos allá a South Beach, ahí, ahí, a darnos unos palos. But anyway, so it's a little bit of a joke. Uh, but these kids coming from Miami, now going all the way to the Naval Academy, how was that transition for you? Like, it was like an eye-opener, like, oh my God, like, this is real. <laughs> it, it absolutely was an eye-opener. Um, so the when I was in high school, um, I kind of felt like I was, I was in a, I felt like I could walk in a room and I, and people would look at me as a leader, right. Okay. Relatively quickly. Um, like 70% of my high school was Hispanic, mostly Cuban. 20% mm. of my high school was like Haitian, gotcha. like five Haitian or, or African American. And then like maybe five to 10% of, of everything else. Mm. Right. So I was used to being a leader in a group where I was the majority. Mm -hmm. When I showed up to the Naval Academy, in my company, we only had, my, my company was basically 40 people, right? Of the 40 people, there was me and a Mexican kid from uh, Texas, oh, wow. right? Yeah. So there was, so if you look at, two differing cultures within the Hispanic community, yeah. right? That's very um, distinct. A, a, a Texan Mexican, <laughs> right? And, yeah. and a, and a Cuban American from Miami are very different. So even initially, like he and I didn't really, Click. like we knew right. we, we like, looked click. around and we were like, we're different, but we didn't immediately like, yeah, click, like, click right. It too. wasn't like an immediate, I mean, he's a great guy and, yeah. and, and I've seen him over the years. We saw each other not long ago. Um, but, but what I realized was, was Hey, people, people actually don't immediately look at you as a leader just because you're there the way I felt like I did when I was in high school. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, you had to, you had to prove yourself. And I think I hate to say it this way, but even prove yourself, you had to prove yourself more, mm -hmm. right? Because, because you're trying to overcome whatever other people's biases are. You don't know what they are. Yeah. You don't know where they come from, but you have to overcome all of that mm -hmm. in order to, to be seen as a leader in that same group. Okay. Um, so yeah, that, that, that was a shocker for me um, in, in that sense. So, so, and then my next question my, for that. So how you overcame all this that you're talking right now, like, Hey, uh, I need to actually, be like more seen because i i'm, I'm used to like hey i'm gonna be I'm, you're tall I mean, you're, you're very tall like you came to my house i was like oh yeah he was very tall you're a tall person but now not about being big and tall but i'm saying like hey now i need to be seen in this group how, how you overcame that like what was your tools that you utilize yeah so i think i think the number one thing that i tried to do was um one thing that we as Hispanics have to deal with is, is this biculturalism, mm -hmm. right? Um, you have, you have a Hispanic culture, but you also have to be American, right? Mm -hmm. Especially in the military, like you have to assimilate enough. The challenge when you're 18, 19, 20, 21, right? When you're first in this new world is 
you have a tendency of going extremes, right? You either want to assimilate too much or you want to stay connected to your roots mm. more. Mm -hmm. And so for me, my path at that time, and it's, it's going to be funny because I'm going to come around. Mm. I, I think I'll come back around to this and why it's important, but um, I wanted to be more Cuban mm. when I was at the Academy. I wanted to be, very proud. Like, Very proud of who roots. I am. Yeah. There's a there's a conflict there because some people think that if you're a hyphenated American, you're less American, right? Mm. If you're a Cuban American or you're Puerto Rican American, you're not American, mm. right? Or you're less than American. That's I think that's a very bad perception. Perception, yeah. But but it's it's on us to to define being American is is totally fine with being Cuban, right? right. You you don't have to give up one to be the other. Right. You can be both. Yeah. Um, so actually at the Naval Academy, we had a Latin American studies club mm -hmm. and the Latin American studies club was basically like a support group, um, at the Academy of midshipmen that were Hispanic, mm -hmm. uh, the vast majority of them. But we also, while I was there had a salsa group. Okay. And so I would, I would teach salsa mm -hmm. at the Naval Academy on Thursdays. Um, and so we'd have, different people from across the academy that would want to learn salsa, nice. you know, but, but that was a way I think that I tried to deal with that. Mm -hmm. Um, in addition to just trying to succeed academically and all that, but, right. but understanding my identity and being proud of it, I think is probably the thing that helped me through it the most. Yeah. And then, uh, and that's, that's amazing that you actually were able to, you know, stand up and, and be seen, uh, in, in the Naval Academy now. So what's the process for, for the Navy assigning the, your actual, jo your actual jobs after you graduate, how, how that process goes? Cause, um, so the people, our listeners can understand that process too, for those yeah. who know. So when you, when you go to the Naval Academy or NROTC, uh, you basically, they take your grades, they take your physical fitness tests, they take your military um, aptitude scores, your performance, and then they rank you out. And then sometimes what major you take matters. So if, for example, you're an engineering or a physics major, mm -hmm. they're going to try to push you to go submarines, oh, right? Yes, um, but you basically... Uh, it's a meritocracy, right? So you're competing to get your choice of mm -hmm. orders. Okay. Um, and then an interesting thing about the Naval Academy is you can also go Marine Corps. So you can graduate from the Naval Academy, but you can commission as a Navy officer, as a, as a ensign, or you can commission as a second lieutenant in the United States Marine Corps. Mm. Um, and about, it's probably like 15 to 20% of the class ends up going Marine Corps, like 200 Oh, of of the people yeah so it's a good big. it's, it's a, a huge it's a good portion yeah um and then but the the process is similar with the nrotc unit mm -hmm. so wherever you're if you're at an nrotc unit it's the same thing mm -hmm. there's specific communities um they're what we call the combat arms communities mm -hmm. uh surface warfare officer which is my community submarines which now in the last 10 years has been incredible because the Navy's opened it up to women. It wasn't open to women, mm. uh, just 10 years ago. Um, Navy SEALs, exec, uh, explosive ordnance disposal and aviators. And then with the Marine Corps, you can go Marine ground or Marine air. Um, but basically when you graduate from the Academy with some exceptions, those are the communities you go into. I see. And then in your particular case, uh, you, you mentioned your surf, surface warfare officer. Can you actually expand on, on what they, they do? Yeah. The, so surface the, warfare officer, essentially, uh, think of a manager on ships. Mm -hmm. And the ultimate goal of a surface warfare officer is to be the captain of a warship, right? So that is kind of the epitome of what being a surface warfare officer is. Um, in my case, uh, you know, I'm on, I'm on my path to get there. Mm. Um, what I've done so far is I've worked in engineering and operations departments on ships. Mm, okay. Um, and then kind of my biggest, my biggest role, uh, was as chief engineer of a cruiser. I had, um, 
basically 85 personnel below me. Mm. I was in charge of all the engineering systems on the ship. Um, so electrical propulsion, fuel, water, right? Uh, so seven gas turbines, mm. which is pretty cool. Wow. Um, so a lot, a lot of responsibility, but, mm. um, one thing I've liked about the Navy, and I think this is true for all the military services and something that corporate America can't offer us is the amount of responsibility that you get right away. Mm. So my first job, right. And I was about to ask you about your first yeah. job. Yeah. So yeah, that's a next, uh, a great cue for your, for our next. So yeah. So once you got granted your surface war officer, so what's next for your next year? What was your next duty station and what was your experience? Yeah. So I, I graduated from the Naval Academy in May. I showed up to my ship at the end of June and we deployed July 10th. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and I show up to the ship and they tell me you're the electrical officer. Uh, they did, they, they didn't see my transcript from the Naval Academy because I didn't do so well in electrical engineering at the Naval Academy, but they still made me the electrical mm. officer. Oh, wow. <laughs> um, but, uh, but immediately I was in charge of all the electrical systems on the ship. I had eight electricians that worked for me and one chief petty officer. Um, and this was a great group, group of people, but immediately I'm a 22 year old kid She's and new. they're giving me that. And then when I'm, that's my day-to-day -day job, mm. but then I also have watch responsibilities. And as my watch role, I'm the conning officer of the ship. I'm driving the ship on the bridge, oh, right? Wow. And, you know. So that's huge. <laughs> right. That's huge. And you're doing this as a 22-year-old kid. Oh, my God. It's like right? a ship so, in your, so wow. that was my first kind of like taste of being, of being a surface warfare officer. And that first deployment was incredible. It was a, it was great. Cause we, we traveled, um, you know, we deployed from Norfolk. We pulled into, to Spain, crossed the Suez canal, you know, visited Oman, visited Dubai, visited wow. Seychelles. You know, we had a lot of, a lot of cool port visits, but then we also did some really cool actual missions, right? Like I'm, I'm doing, things that are actually on the news, right? Anti counter piracy operations, um, cruise missile strikes on terrorist camps, like really cool stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, so that was my first taste of being a surface warfare officer. Yeah. And, and so, so how was that? Like now that's your job, uh, day to day job, but how was like that difference from Miami now to your next duty station and, and traveling like this kids from Miami it was like oh my god like this is like getting real now like right so well, how was that your actual civilian experience like enriched right yeah like, a lot of enrichment well what what I think came out of all that was was just that sense of the world is way bigger than than, than, than you, just than is where than you're born just where and, I'm born yeah, right. and all that um you know, we pulled into Bar Barcelona and it, it was like incredible to see that, that city and, and all the history. Um, we pulled into Dubai and, you know, Dubai, the way I characterized Dubai when I was there, um, which really interestingly, I found this out not long ago, um, the project manager for the Burj Dubai, the big, really tall building. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The big toe. He's actually uh, a rear admiral, Navy SEAL. Okay. Hispanic. Oh, wow. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so Hispanic yeah, like yeah. everywhere. Like, was, yeah, no, he's <laughs> um, everywhere. We, we Rodriguez. Everywhere. Uh, wow. Rear Admiral um, Rodriguez. So, Richard Rodriguez. Uh, but anyway, neither here nor there. Um, when I was there in Dubai, the thing that I thought about Dubai is Dubai looks like New York City. Miami and Las Vegas all rolled all into together. one. It was crazy, right? <laughs> I I walk in. I walk into uh, first we we get to this huge mall and it's got like gold pillars and Ferraris and Lamborghinis out front. Wow. You walk in and then you see very well dressed guys in suits, and then right behind them, like like a guy wearing like the the standard like the be, the, the drab the right, and then women all covered up and then women wearing 
like dresses like you would see in Miami South Beach. It's like, like a westernized, westernized it, with like some. It was it was culture. it was different. It was it was a very different experience, and and that's the thing that I learned right mm. in in my visit there to Dubai, my visit to Oman, my visit to Seychelles, my visit to Barcelona is every country, every culture is different, right? And you have to learn and try and understand mm -hmm. what it is that they have, what they're offering, right? And, and try and try and not look at the world just by your perspective mm -hmm. is really what I, what I think I learned the most out of. No, 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 this is great experiences. So um, any recommendations for those that are looking to actually join the Navy? Do you recommend them like, hey, join? Because like, and we're going to talk about this in a moment, but I just want to, I'm, I'm getting ahead to the game. But like, can you transmit your experiences to so, so people that actually say like, hey, I want to travel the world kind of thing? Like, Can you convey that? To yeah, them? yeah. So, um, I mean, if you want to travel the world, the Navy is the way to do it. Mm -hmm. um, we've got, overseas bases i've been stationed i was stationed in puerto rico which is yeah we, we're about to yeah we'll talk about puerto rico in a little yeah, bit yeah. um but i've been i've been stationed there i was stationed in japan for a few years also something incredible if you ever have a chance to go to japan make sure you go um <laughs> yeah. i i just incredible culture um but i think i think if you if whatever the reason you want to join the military just remember that you can't lose sight of why right. you joined, right? So for me, it's a little more enduring because because the reason I joined is is that sense of obligation. Um, and the reason I've stayed, there's two reasons why I've stayed, mm -hmm. right? One is I don't feel like I'm done giving giving back, paying back. I feel like there's still, you know, there's still something in me that wants to serve. Mm -hmm. But the the second reason, I think the most important reason, especially for us officers, is the desire to lead sailors, right? The desire to lead others. Mm. Those are the two reasons why I've why I've stayed in the military. So you could you could enter the military and go into the military because you want to travel the world. Right. But that's you know, that probably won't be enough to keep you around, right? right. But the people will keep you around. I think if 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 you commit to the people, they'll they'll convince you. No, of course, and and us as officers, that's what we are here for, right? So we are leading, in my case, soldiers, go army because uh, the go navy and army game is coming up like yeah. uh, now in December. Yeah. So I'm rooting for for army. Uh, yeah. Sorry, <laughs> but I know you you go. It's okay. It's okay. I mean, we're we're one joint force. There's only one day out of the year that we have a fight. So it's a fight, but I just go. Is it just uh, messing a little bit with you, sir? But now let's let's talk about. Um, your time in, in Puerto Rico. So you serve uh, from 2013 to 2016 at uh, the OIC for the uh, an officer recruiter for yeah, can Navy we, recruiting. Let's come back to that. Okay. Because I actually realized that there was something that I wanted to okay, share. Just, just go ahead. With, so one, going back to, um, you asked me if, if there was something I would want to communicate to people that right. were looking to yes. join the military. Well, I would say... Uh, there's one leadership thing that I think is really important and it goes back to what I mentioned earlier when I was at the Naval Academy. So during my first deployment, right. I talked about all the great places that we pulled into, mm -hmm. but in one of my first weeks there, um, I was sitting in a, in the log room and the log room's like an office okay. on the ship. And, um, I was not on watch. We weren't on duty. But it was me and two other guys, um, junior sailors, right? So E E4, E5, right? And I heard them speak in Spanish. Mm -hmm. And I was sitting next to them. And for a little while I was I was afraid to engage because I, you know, I wasn't really sure about it. But at some point, I mean, all of us were looking at Facebook, right? Mm -hmm. They were talking about what was going on in their family. I'm listening to them in Spanish. I jump in, right? Mm -hmm. Well, one. They weren't expecting that, right? They didn't realize that I could speak Spanish, yeah. right? So I jumped in, started speaking <laughs> Spanish, and so, oh my god, he it was so Spanish. It was fantastic, right? And it was great. And for the yeah. next like ten minutes, 
I was engaging with these sailors and I was connecting. I was like literally feeling like, okay, these are, these, these are guys that are just like me, right? Similar to me. Um, and as a leader, that's great when you can, when you can empathize and connect with right. your sailors, right? Well, while this is going on, a chief petty officer, E7, walks into the log room mm. and basically puts me at attention and says, Mr. Machado, we're in, we're in the United States Navy, not the Mexican Navy. We don't speak Spanish on this ship, mm. right? And basically, like, dress me down, mm -hmm. right? And that moment was intriguing for me mm. because at the time, I didn't know that what he did was wrong. Mm -hmm. I thought what he did was right. I thought, I thought he was trying to give me guidance. But I didn't realize that he was way off. One, it's perfectly fine for you to speak Spanish mm -hmm. when you're not on watch, when you're not given an official order, right? Or we weren't in a duty space or a duty location. There was no reason that I couldn't speak Spanish. Mm -hmm. But the scary thing was he was so uncomfortable with my ethnic culture and, and this language that I was using that he was willing to break military norm and custom by putting, by, as an E7, correcting an 01, right? And then doing it in front of two junior sailors, right? right? I mean, yeah, I, in, in that case, uh, the, the professional way to do so is like to pull you apart and right. talk do uh, behind doors as a great right. leader said, like, hey, Mr. Machado, um, I don't see it feasible for you to talk in Spanish because we're like X, Y, and Z, whatever reason he right, 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 gave right. you. And then you can go with the argument like, hey, maybe because we know that regulation says, like like you were mentioned, right? So regulation says that you... The, the language of our military armed forces is English. And then if you give me like a direct order, are we talking about the radio? Is like a, something official? Yes. So it's, English is the, is, the, is, the, is the language. Right. But uh, I see your point that like, hey, we're not doing anything official. We're just like, you know, right. our guards are down. Why I cannot, you know, talk in my modern uh, language in this right. case. And, and so what that did to me though, and I didn't realize it at the time, but what I, what I did was I tried to assimilate more into this Navy, that Navy, right? Mm -hmm. The, the, the Navy that wasn't as open, right? Which is, which is funny because it, I did the opposite of what I had done at the Naval Academy, right? When I was challenged at the Naval Academy, I felt like I went toward my, toward my, to your, to your my roots more. Yeah. Now I'm a Naval officer and I'm trying to justify, okay, got it. I need to be representative of, you know, the whole Navy, this, that, the other thing. Well, fast forward two years to my next ship. I'm on my next ship. I've been on the ship for about five months. And there's this young lady who's getting out. She's, she's not going to reenlist. Mm. Um, and she was a single mother from LA, Mexican background. And I pull her to the side and I say, hey, why is it that you're getting out? And she says, well, sir, I've been in the Navy for four years and you're the first Hispanic officer that I've met in my four years and you're not even Hispanic. You don't speak Spanish. You don't dance salsa. You don't know anything about reggaeton. You don't eat, you don't eat Spanish food or Hispanic food. You have no similarity to me, right? And what I realized at that moment was I had, I had, devalued my identity to the point mm. where I was no longer being authentic, okay. right? I was no longer being genuine as a leader mm. and people see that. So, um, what that did to me was it pushed me back in the other direction again, right? Mm. Kind of, it was, it was, uh, going back to your, your roots. Right. Like well, bit. and, so, and it's not, it's not that, and it's not roots so much. It's, it's, it's being who you are mm -hmm. and being comfortable with who you are. Right. That's the challenge. Um, there's nothing wrong with being a naval officer, right? But being a naval officer is not defined by whether you're willing to speak Spanish mm -hmm. with junior sailors in a non watch space, not on duty, right? That has nothing to do with being a naval officer. That just has to do with being a, a normal person. Person, person, right? Human, human being. Yeah, yeah person. You're so, like, so in my time. head, I'm in my head, I'm justifying not speaking Spanish because. I don't want to be a bad naval officer, mm -hmm. but one thing had nothing to do with the other. Right. Right. So, um, 
And I was actually becoming a bad naval officer because now an individual that should have been able to connect with me didn't see me as a role model, mm -hmm. which means I failed her, mm -hmm. right, as a leader. And that's, that's a humbling moment, right? So um, I think, so the lesson going back to, you know, what's the point of the story? Yeah. Well, the point of the story is you got to be, you got to be authentic. You got to be who you are and be proud of it and lead with that, mm -hmm. right? Because when you're not, the only thing you're doing is finding ways for other people to exclude you and not read right. you right. No, and, and people can, I mean, soldiers, sailors, and, and coasties, and Marines, they, they can read leaders, right? So whether you're right. Re real or wrong, I mean, real or fake. If you're like a fake leader, they, they can sense that. They can they can see it through you. Like, uh, so, yeah, so so I, my birthday was yesterday. Um, oh, happy birthday. Thank you, sir. I appreciate oh, it. Oh, man, now I really feel bad about, <laughs> so, about what I talked to you about earlier. <laughs> no, 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 no it's, it's my birthday. But, like, and it goes back to your point because, I and I want to share this real quick, a lot of messages through Facebook uh, came yesterday on my personal Facebook, uh, happy birthday, and et cetera. But one got to my attention, a uh, former soldier of mine, um, she's a she, she's a Afro American uh, uh, descent, but she posted like a like a comment on my Facebook wall said like Hey sir, thank you for being so genuine with us as a leader, because we and me and my family appreciate what you did for us like in the moment of needs. When I was uh, just a second lieutenant back then, yeah, like, I'm talking about ten years ago, yeah, and I was like, oh my god, like that grew out to my deep heart because like ten years later, this former soldier of mine. Right, because it doesn't matter you're Hispanic, black, white. Yeah, I don't know, like yellow. You have to be genuine and and, and as a leader, and pe and people will follow you to the moon if you actually are genuine with them and real. Yeah, and you, at the moment you start being fake, yeah, you're gonna lose them. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so I think that back back to your story. Yeah, from a personal. I I agree. Yeah, that that it's you're absolutely right, and I've you know. I've had moments in my career where, um, you know, I'll give you, I'll give you one, one other story. Uh, my parents were on the way to pick me up from the airport. I flew back to Miami. My parents were on the way to pick me up from the airport and they got into a really, really bad car accident. Mm. And, uh, I ended up, you know, they immediately went to the ER. My, my mom was in ICU. And I get a phone call the next day from my captain who was, I, I was working in Puerto Rico at the time. We were going to talk about Puerto Rico, but I was working in Puerto Rico at the time, but my parent command was in Miami. Uh, and so I worked for Navy Recruiting District Miami at the time. And so my captain, uh, Nathan King, uh, well, actually, it was the CMC, Michael Clark. He calls me and he says, hey, are you, are, you at the, are you at the hospital right now? And I said, yeah, I am. I'm, I'm here. I'm at the hospital. Hospital was like 30 minutes away from headquarters. They're like, oh, okay, we're, we're going to come see you, right? And here, you know, 30 minutes later, Commander Nathan King and CMC Michael Clark, right, my captain and my CMC at the time show up in whites to the hospital to come visit my mom at the ICU. Right. Like great leadership right there. Not only great leadership, but that is, but, but then genuine, genuine. desire right. to show that they, that they, they care. care. They care. They care. Right. That's what, there's yeah. the moment that happened. There's nothing that, that those two men could, ever ask of me that I wouldn't be able to do for them. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. That is the demonstration of leadership, right? The leadership is being able to convince and influence other people to do what is the best thing, right? right? Whatever that might be. I mean, there's no better way to do it than to prove that you actually care. Right. Okay, right? Go. And so that was a moment for me that, that it probably also solidified my desire to stay in the Navy mm -hmm. because I didn't, I didn't feel like I had leaders like that very often in my career before this. And so seeing that and seeing it in such a profound way, it also taught me like, Hey, like when one of your sailors has a kid, right. Or one of your sailors has, 
something going on at the hospital, like it's okay for you to go see how they're doing. Mm -hmm. And something that I remember Nathan King, what he said to me uh, once was the great thing about those that serve in uniform we're the only job where the person has already signed a check up to and including the price of their life to work. Mm. And that's why we as leaders have to be there for them, right? right? Not the same with corporate America, not the same with other jobs, right? Mm. You know, if you tell some, if somebody says, hey, they're in the hospital because of whatever, their family's going through something. In the military, it's expected that that your teammates and your command is going to go check in on you. Take care, take care of you. And you don't know what you're going to get outside, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, I think I think that's something else that's that's definitely worth acknowledging about military service. No, mo most definitely. I, I, I everything I concur with everything you just mentioned, sir. I appreciate that to share. Now. Let's go to Puerto Rico now. You want to oh, yeah. go to Puerto Rico, John? Do you want to jump to Puerto Rico? So yeah, we can. We can talk Puerto Rico. I love Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico, my beautiful island, right? Yeah, uh, in the Caribbean. We had a great conversation before. We this did. <laughs> we did, and 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 I'll tell you, um, I, you know, I'd heard it before, but it really, really made a lot more sense once I lived there. Right. Okay. Cuba y Puerto Rico son hmm. un pájaro de dos alas, right? Mm -hmm. Like it's, 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 uh, it was an amazing island. I love being down there. My time down there, uh, I was, I was able to do a lot. I think I was able to do a lot. And it's actually where I, where I kind of began my time as, as member of the board of directors for ANSO. Mm -hmm. But, um, when I was down there, I was an officer recruiter, uh, for the Navy. So I was, basically recruiting for the OCS opportunities as well as all the like really nuanced other things. So like medical core, uh, medical staff core. So like your healthcare administrators, your physical, uh, phys physician's assistants, your, um, physical therapists, um, dental, uh, civil engineer corps um so all all those different communities basically and then i also was able to do um it was my first time being a blue and gold officer so i was helping kids who like me 10 years before that uh were interested in going to the naval academy um and then also able to help out high school students that were interested in doing, uh, attending Navy ROTC units. Um, so it was a really good experience cause I got a lot of the exposure of all the opportunities mm -hmm. of becoming a Naval officer. Um, I also saw some things that were concerning that drove me to write, um, a point paper. And in this point paper, I talked about some of the, the things that I saw that concerned me about Hispanic officer recruiting in Puerto Rico. Mm. There were certain things that I felt that were discriminatory. And the fact that I was Cuban, right? It, it wasn't like a, I'm Cuban born in the United States, but I'm seeing these things happening to Puerto Rican native Puerto Ricans. Mm -hmm. And I felt like, you know, something needs to be said about this. So I had heard about ANSO when I was at the Naval Academy, mm -hmm. going back to that group, the Latin American studies club, Kind of Anso used to come and talk to us at the Latin American Studies Club. I see. Right. Okay, sure. So Carlos del Toro mm. is now the Secretary of the Navy, but the first time I met him was when I was at the Naval Academy as a midshipman, and he came to mentor us. He had already gotten out of the Navy. He was just working. He was a business owner for his own company, and he was just coming to mentor kids at the Naval Academy. The cadets, right. Yeah. Yeah. And so that was the first time I met him. But that was when I first heard about Anso. Well, fast forward 2014, um, I write this point paper and I kind of get to a point where I feel like it's not going anywhere. It didn't, 
Like these are big issues that, that big Navy needs to look at. Yeah. Right. And so wasn't really getting any traction. So I reached out to Anso. I reached out to then president, uh, rear admiral Will Rod- Rodriguez, who's been a mentor, uh, and a friend ever since. But I basically said to him, Hey, sir, I'm a officer recruiter in Puerto Rico and I'm seeing things that concern me. Um, do you mind taking a look at this point paper? So I sent him the point paper and, you know, left for the day. Come back the next morning, open my email, and there's an email from the chief of naval operations, Jonathan Greener, right? And it says, uh, thanks, Will. We'll take a look and staff this accordingly. So basically, Without me knowing, Rear Admiral Rodriguez sent my point paper directly to the Chief of Naval Operations, right? The four star, Mm -hmm. and said, Hey, look at these things that are happening in Puerto Rico. You guys should probably take a look at this, Mm -hmm. right? And so that was the first moment that I realized, wait a second, okay, ANSO is an avenue for us to actually affect change within the organization in a way that could help those behind us, people coming behind us. Because I felt like there was a there were clear disadvantages and I could get into detail about it. I don't want to, but but I felt like there were things that could be done to make it more fair and just for Native Puerto Ricans who were applying. Yeah, and I think one of the biggest challenges, and I can talk about experience from experience because I graduated from uh, Puerto Rico University, ROTC. They have the Army, the Air Force uh, out there. For us, it's the language. That's one of the biggest ones. Um, if we don't score like the 2-2 two, two and, uh, and the OPI, the oral proficiency interview, or we don't have like a high score on the English, like you can be the best candidate ever, but you don't have that level of proficiency back to to the to the English point that we, we talked uh, earlier, uh, you couldn't commission. Like basically, right. I, saw, I saw buddies of mine like not commissioning because like it was a discriminator on the language. It was right. one of them one of them. So what what I thought was intriguing, um, I had two I had oh I'll get into this a little bit because I think it's it'll highlight what I'm trying to talk about, but I had two applicants and one was what we call an alpha ASVAB score. So this guy scored like above a 92 wow. on the ASVAB, which means he was immediately offered nuke to go enlisted nuke program, wow. right? Immediately enlisted nuke program. But he also was interested in going surface warfare, my community. Mm. And so I set him up to take the test for that. He scored one point below the minimum in order to do this, right? There was another guy, same week, also took the test. He scored the same, 44. So the, the minimum was 45, it was, it's, they both scored 44. And then I started pulling the string back. I started looking into this a, a little bit. So one guy literally is being told he can go work on nuclear power plants, right? by the Navy, mm. but then he's being told that he can't be a surface warfare officer, even though he has a bachelor's degree. Okay. Like he meets all the, it, to me, it didn't make any sense. Why? Right. Like if his English was good enough to pass the ASVAB, <laughs> yeah. then why is, why it's did he good. fall short yeah. on this? Right. Okay. The other guy, um, originally came to my office because he was interested in medical programs. He didn't score high enough on the MSAT. So, um, he took the OAR because I, I had talked to him about being a surface warfare officer and he came back a, a week or two later and was like, man, that sounds really cool. I think I want to do that. But he also had an offer to go to Harvard and study biomedical engineering. Hmm. He had graduated from UPR. Um, my, my OS? No, oh, uh, yeah. Rio Piedras yeah. biology program. Hmm. So guy's smart, right? And he's got an offer to start a master's program at Harvard in biomedical engineering, Mm -hmm. right? He scores a 44 too. You're telling me these two guys cannot get a high enough score to qualify to be surface warfare officers? What's going on here? So I looked at the details. Well, the average in Puerto Rico 
on this test was a 41. So if you look at if you look at the peers, like their peer group, they were scoring three points above their peer group. In New England, if you compare it to New England, the the average in New England is 54 on this test. Hmm. Right? So you're telling me that somebody who takes the test in New England and scores a 45 is not better than these guys in Puerto Rico that scored a 44. The other guy is scoring nine points below the average in below the average of their own peer group. Right. These two students are scoring three points above it. And oh, by the way, the two students that are taking it in Puerto Rico, they're taking the test in their second language. Mm -hmm. Don't wish it's English. Uh, right. Yeah. Like if, if that to you, I, I, what do I want? Okay. We talk about this being a meritocracy and the best rising to the top. I want the purest talent, mm -hmm. right? The purest talent. And these two guys were the purest talent, right? Right. But they weren't getting an offer to even show up to the table to be considered for, for a program. Mm -hmm. Right. And so that was one of the things that I saw that really bothered me. It, it, it triggered me to be like, Hey, we got to do something about this because this is wrong. We're not, and it's not because it's wrong because they're Puerto Rican, right? It's not that. It's it's wrong because the Navy is not getting the best people. But yeah, it's not. It's not because they're Puerto Ricans or not. Right. It's not comes down to like they are Puerto Ricans or whatever the case. Right. Be. It's, it's it's like, not. Hey, they have the good talent that we just let them escape. Instead, of like recruiting them for our our you know force benefit. Right. War, well, so. We didn't let him escape in a way. Mm. One, the other, the the nuke one ended up coming into the Navy okay. as a nuke. I don't know what's happened to him, but he may already be an officer, right? He may have already found an officer program. He may have gotten out by now. I don't know. But at the moment of first meeting the Navy, we didn't offer the best thing that we could have for him. Right, um, the other one, interestingly, entered the reserves as a naval officer in um, some healthcare field. Uh, I think he's a industrial hygienist, but so, but it took us eight years to get him in. Wow. Right. Yeah. He had to go get a master's degree. Do this, but <laughs> it's so, more like path. So, more, so it's like, it's more trouble. It, why did we, you know, I, he could, he could be a Lieutenant commander today, right. Working on ships as a surface warfare officer. Instead he's doing something else, which is fine. No, no harm, no foul. But if we want the best war fighting force, the best joint force for war fighting, which is what we are always talking right. about, we need the purest, rawest form of talent that we can then develop, right? And so whenever I talk about like the things that seem wrong with our recruiting effort or our retention effort or anything like that, again, yes, it impacts the Hispanic community in a way, mm -hmm. but that's not the reason I'm talking about it. And I'm talking about it because we can't have the best people rise to the top. If, if the best people aren't getting into the system, mm -hmm. right. Because of these things that are, that are in the way for them. Mm -hmm. So. No, uh, yeah. And, and I, I hear what you're saying. Like, definitely if you have the talent, you should get the talent, like not having more layers to, to why they cannot join X, Y, and C. If you you're showing them like, hey, this person like have all the capacity and beyond, like why we are like putting some troubles to get into in, the system, right? And again, I think it doesn't go back to oh, he's Puerto Rican or not. It's just more like so like why some some yes and some don't. And that, that you know, when you make that comparison, right? That's when you're like, okay, so they yes and they 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 don't. Um, but yeah, it's it's good to hear that that you were able to do that. Now you you keep mentioning that you know about ANSO since you were in the Naval Academy. So how you actually got started to get in, involved in the board of directors in in the ANSO community? How that started? Like yeah, so um, at the time, uh, the Navy service rep for ANSO was Evita Salas, who's Commander Evita Salas. She's a HR officer, um, and uh, she was looking for a relief. It was not long after I had sent that, that point paper to the president. Um, and so Riyad Rodriguez asked me if I'd be interested in being the Navy service rep, which 
I agreed to. Um, I, at the time, I was also really passionate about this. I was because I was seeing it like right. day in and day out. I'm seeing it. Um, I'm seeing a lot of talent in Puerto Rico that we're just not getting to. Right. I saw it with the NROTC. The fact that there was there was no NROTC yeah, unit we, on the we, island. We spoke about that too, right? Yeah. So um, there was no NROTC unit on the island, but the you know the army and the air force are well positioned, mm -hmm. and so army and air force is able to leverage the amazing talent and the amazing education mm -hmm. that is available in Puerto Rico. Um. Particularly in my wife, my OS with engineering, like their engineering program is incredible. Yeah. And what's crazy about that is like the Navy engineering civilians, right? Nav C, Nav Air, Office of Naval Research, Nuclear Propulsion, like all those people are going to my OS to recruit. Oh wow. For the civilian engineering jobs. But we don't, but, we don't, but we're we don't not. We, we don't have a Navy ROTC <laughs> unit to to recruit them. Yeah, leveraging leveraging yeah. The talent, right? And and why is that important? It's important because if you look at how many officers are coming in, at least with the Navy, about forty percent are coming in through the Naval Academy, about forty percent are coming in through an ROTC, and the mm -hmm. remaining twenty percent are coming in. The from OCS. OCS, okay. You, you have direct direct commission too? We do. Okay. We do. For um for reserve okay. reserve and like medical programs, we have direct But mostly is NROTC, uh Naval Academy and the OCS. Right, okay. for like the combat arms. So so like when we talk about um like surface warfare, submarines, aviation, uh all that. So but but I you know I'm I'm looking at it and I'm saying to myself, wait a second, the NROTC units, if you're, a, if you're a native Puerto Rican, you either get an offer to go to the Naval Academy, which is hard, mm -hmm. or you have to wait to graduate from college and then apply for one of our programs, mm. right? There's a couple of nuances there. There's a new program that you can get two years into, co into college, but, and then there's a civil engineering program which includes architects that you can get a year before graduating but but for the most part you have to wait well when the army and the air force is in your face and you're seeing friends that are putting on uniforms and they want and they're serving and they're getting their education paid for right like the navy is at a dis well the navy and the marine corps are at a disadvantage in puerto rico because army and air force is present in those in those colleges mm -hmm. but the navy isn't it's the Navy not. ROTC isn't and and your Navy ROTC units are commissioning Navy and Marine Corps officers. Yeah, that and we spoke about that. They commissioned both Marine and Navy as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that um you know I found out when I was down there, La Politecnica mm -hmm. de Puerto Rico, Probably which is in the, in, the, in San Juan. Yeah. Engineer producing. Yeah, one of the top engineering producing schools. Mm -hmm. They and by the way, when I was down there, they had they were one of the only schools in the country that had the National Security Agency's cybersecurity accredited program. Like one of the only schools in the country, mm. right? And they weren't part, you know, that school wasn't an NROTC unit, right? So um, La Politecnica ended up submitting an application in 2015 to be an NROTC unit. So that was another big thing that I thought we were able to accomplish. So, All but right. obviously they, they haven't established a unit there yet, but they, they applied. So that, you know, they're on the waiting list. Yeah. And then after, after you finished your time in, in, in Puerto Rico, what was for, what was, what was the next thing for you uh, on your career after you finished your tour in Puerto Rico? So that's my next thing. After that, I was chief engineer uh, out in Japan. So, um, I went to, I was stationed near Cosco, which by the way, um, the one thing that, that I was really surprised about was how much of a Hispanic community there is in your mm. like that th there's, there were a lot of Hispanics there. Right. Um, and so I was like, I was really surprised I, and, and I was happy about it. Um, 
but I was there as chief engineer of USS Curtis Wilbur. Um, that's actually the first time that I had a commanding officer that was Hispanic. Mm. So all of my commanding officers before that were, were not Hispanic. Mm. Um, so that was a really good opportunity for me. Um, this officer, I could, I could see myself in him. He was, he's a great role model and a mentor and a friend. And, um, you know, I, I, I really wanted to work, you know, well for him. Um, and he was Venezuelan, half Venezuelan, half American. Um, and so it was, you know, it was a great, great to see that. Um, I also had another mentor that was out there at the same time, which is, uh, Captain Tony then. Uh, so we had actually had interesting connections. He, he was, my first ship, he was the chief engineer on that ship, two chief engineers before I was there. So he was really close with, with a senior chief that took care of me when I was on that, on that first ship. Mm. So, um, but anyway, long story short is, uh, that was my next job. Chief engineer. It was, it was hard, but I had a great team out there. Um, I even had a sailor, um, that had joined the Navy from Puerto Rico. Mm -hmm. And she was actually the best, uh, in the debt pool at the time. And she ended up being in my department in, oh, wow. in, in, on that ship. Right. So it was great. Um, it was a great experience. Uh, you know, and I, I learned a lot while I was out there. And then, um, I think you perform, you work at the Pentagon as well, right? The I did. Yeah. yeah. So I, there was, a. I worked at the Pentagon. Um, that was the job that I had before mm -hmm. I started at the War College. So I, I started at Marine Corps War College in Quantico in July mm -hmm. of this year. Um, but for the last two and a half years, I've been working at the Pentagon uh, for OpNav. So that's the Chief of Naval Operations, um, basically staff. And I was working warfighting requirements and capabilities. And I was in the Mine Warfare Desk. Um, Mine warfare is an area that doesn't get a lot of attention uh, within the Navy, which I think is is not good. Um, 50, since World War II, right, since 1945, 15 of the 19 ships that have been sunk or put out of commission by an enemy weapon have been mines, oh, wow. right? And yet, when you talk about mine countermeasures in the Navy, it's like, this, it's like a put it's to the like, corner, like, right? It's it's like the the redheaded stepchild, right? Mm -hmm. Like nobody talks about it. Mm -hmm. So um, I learned a lot in that job, uh, but I also see a lot of opportunity in that world. Um, it also taught me a lot about how the system works, right? There's the Pentagon is really intriguing, right? Because you are literally like hop, skip, and jump away from SecDef, from CNO, SecNav. Um, but there's a lot of really smart people that are in that building. And there's a lot of things that are happening day in and day out. And it's good to know that there's people that are fighting that battle, the bureaucratic battle, mm -hmm. while others of us are are in the fleet and doing the things that we're doing for yeah, tactical like environment. the tactical and operational environment, but there's a lot of big thoughts and big things that happen in the Pentagon. So in a sense, I felt a lot more confidence, right? Like mm -hmm. when you're, when you're on the ship all the time, like you're like, what are those people in DC even thinking about? Right. Mm -hmm. And then now oh, you yeah, kind of, the the you, you yeah. see it on the other side and you're like, Oh, okay. Oh, okay I, I get yeah. it now. You know, <laughs> like, okay, I got it. I got, I got it. it now. So, but it taught me a lot. It also taught me, you know, how important the fleet is. Right. So like, one thing that I figured out while we were at the, while I was at the Pentagon is like, if the fleet isn't asking for something, nobody's going to get it. Mm. Like people aren't over there just like coming up with their own things. No, like the fleet has to ask for something and then we drive to get that. Right. Right. And I think that's really intriguing because I didn't, I didn't realize how much power like the fleet has in driving of course. what we're trying yeah. to do. Right. I, I mean, it felt like it was always, 
something far away, but really they're they're it's doing they're trying to connect. It's connect because like we're talking about strategic level operations, but the tactical is what drives everything because like everything starts at the tactical up front for the strategic level to actually action anything. Like you have all the echelons, it's a tactical, you have your operational and strategic and that's when you're like, yeah, the tactical, I don't know what they're doing out there. They might not, but now you it, seeing it from the other side are like okay yeah i feel now that they're doing something but we need to get the requirements in order for us to actually action anything yeah that's basically that's great and then you, you actually mentioned that you started your uh at the marine corps uh war college in quantico yeah how that going so far for you man it has been incredible so yesterday yeah uh the chairman and the joint chiefs of staff spoke to us mm -hmm. general brown mm -hmm. right like the senior most military officer. Um, Thursday, I went to the White House and was with members of the National Security Council talking about a bunch of different stuff. Uh, Wednesday, we had General, uh, retired General John Kelly, who was the White House chief of staff to, to President-elect Trump when he was president last time. Mm -hmm. Plus he was Southcom. Plus he was um, what was the other thing he did? He was uh, Secretary of Homeland Security. Like, and then and then on Tuesday, we had a meeting with um, Japanese military, including the former Vice Chief for International Relations within their Defense Department. Like like all this in one week, mm -hmm. right? Like the opportunity to learn from all those people and, and really study. I think what's, what I've, what I've really liked about war college more than anything is the time to step back, look at the world and try and think the big thoughts about what's happening. Right. Um, you know, we were talking before, uh, before we started about kind of how, politics changes right mm -hmm. and you know we were talking about how it's changing in puerto rico we talked about how how it's changing within the country right and being able to understand that we as military officers have a responsibility to be apolitical mm -hmm. but that doesn't mean we have to be ignorant of, of the happening. political environment what's happening right in the environment. we can't be ignorant of the political environment it because is, it's one of the requirements when we talk about analysis in our in our strategic or operational level we need to understand the political construct of, of any country as we go in so it is important for us to understand our own political construct but we have to be apolitical but we need to understand what's happening right and and certainly um the chairman and joint chiefs of staff mm -hmm. mentioned it. He said, you know, I'm military advisor to the president. You cannot give really good military advice if you don't understand the political ramifications of some of that, right? Like there's politics do weigh mm -hmm. and, and you cannot be ignorant of it. Right. Right. So um, the thing that I think, I've learned over the last few months, and I've still got plenty to go, but um, is that I need to I need to open my open my aperture, right? I open my aperture even more and be cognizant while still being apolitical of all the potential influences that are coming in, you know, right. Russia and China, you know, pacing threat, um, the pacing threat, emerging threat, mm -hmm. uh, like we need to understand what they're doing when, when the Chinese coast guard is ramming into Philippine coast guard vessels. Right. Mm -hmm. And when they're you know, ignoring territorial claims by other countries, right? Like we need to understand that in order to be prepared Right. Should something happen, mm -hmm. right? We need to understand what the red lines could be, so that when we see it happening, we're we are we're prepared. ready. We prepare to uh, so, take action. Yeah, yep. Now let's uh, go back to ANSO and the mission. So I know that the ANSO plays a significant role in promoting uh, the diversity and inclusion within the Navy and the sea services. 
So how does the answer mission resonate with you personally? And then in regards of like, we know you're the vice president. So can you speak more about that, the answer mission with him? Yeah. So, um, you know, and so, uh, like anyone can read it on the website, but it was established right after secretary of the Navy, Eduardo Hidalgo, um, retired as SECNAV. Um, and the purpose was to create a Navy, Marine Corps, and Coast Guard that reflects the face of the nation. Specifically, the background was he was looking at a table of officers, general and flag officers. And at the time, the Coast Guard was part of the Department of the Navy. And he said, this table doesn't look like America. We need to do something about that. Mm -hmm. So as soon as he retired, he established ANSO as a 501c3 nonprofit. Um, and so, you know, when we talk about that, what we're really talking about is generating flag and general officers, command master chiefs and sergeant majors that look like the rest of the country. There's a nuance there, right? Because it's not necessarily about diversity and inclusion. It goes back to what I said earlier, mm -hmm. which is you want the best to rise to the top. Right. And if the best talent is not getting the support they need or the development they need or the mentoring they need, then you're not actually getting the best force. You're not getting, you're not getting a meritocracy as we define it, right? You're getting something else, right? Mm -hmm. And so the drive was we need to develop, professionally develop, mentor, and support our service members so that they can keep rising. Um, and so that's what ANSO really was established for. Um, we are, you know, we're referred to as an employee resource group. I think we need to not refer to ourselves as an employee resource group. We're really a leader resource group. Mm -hmm. Like there's a, there's a stereotype, unfortunately, within American society that Latinos, Hispanics were really good workers, were very dedicated, but we're not leaders, mm -hmm. right? And that's a false narrative. And we've got to change that false narrative. And so, you know, I think we're a leader resource group. Um, but we're different. Uh, and, you know, one of the things that I think that that we need to do a better job of is telling our story, right? So things like what you're doing with the podcast mm -hmm. is really how we're getting after that goal. Because right. it's really hard to to share the story. We as Hispanics, we you know, the good majority of Hispanics have a sense of humility. They don't want to be too um, arrogante. They don't want to be out there too much. And so we, we sometimes shy away from sharing our stories, but we actually need to fight that. We need to fight that cultural norm a little right. bit and get out there more mm -hmm. because other people need to see us, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so I think with, with where with where ANSO is going, um, we have to look at what corporate America has done. So corporate America, um, when they talk about their ERGs, their affinity groups, those affinity groups are built and paid from within the organization. Mm -hmm. They're not, they're not a separate, they're not separate. They're not a nonprofit. They're a separate entity. From, right. They're part of the it. Actual corporate America. Right. So we're a 501c3 nonprofit, but we don't, we don't get any real, we don't get Navy funding to exist, right? Um, in corporate America, if you got assigned to be the president of your ERG, like that's, that's almost a guaranteed opportunity to get to the C-suite, right? Mm -hmm. You're about to become an executive, right? Um, and so, you know, we got to do that. We with what 
we our partnership with Hispa is what I think is really powerful. It's something that any member of Anso can do once or twice a year. You know, do a video call or go to a to a, a middle school and talk about their service. Mm-hmm. Um, so you know, we have a lot of partnerships going on. Partnership with Alva. You know, and we need to work more with the services, but. I think the Air Force is doing things really well with their heat, right? Heat is the Hispanic Empowerment and Advancement Program or an advancement team. And they work directly for the Secretary of the Air Force. And they give guidance and advice on policy mm-hmm. regarding regarding Hispanics directly to the Secretary of the Air Force. Mm-hmm. And so does the same thing, but we don't do it within. We're a non-federal entity. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, we've got to, especially since we're looking at how, how do we, how do we get Army and Air Force more engaged, engaged. with us, right? Um, what I think we need to move toward is, and we've got to get to a point where we have a DOD leader resource group that's funded and made possible by by the services, right? Um, and and what that means is identify, like actually have somebody identifying who are the officers that are coming up, who are the O3s, the O5s, the O6s, the O7s, like what do they need to get to the next level, right? Or the e, E7s and E8s that are, that are, selecting really early mm-hmm. and they have the possibility of someday being sergeant major of the marine corps like ruiz's right or um or mcpawn right we've got to build we've got to find those individuals and we gotta we gotta mentor them and walk them through you know that's an effort that anso has tried to do but we're you know it's really hard to do that mm-hmm. so you know as i step away as i step away from being vice president um, with, with the elections coming up, I think the thing I'm, the thing I want more than anything is to help people understand that it's really, it's the culture of being an ANSO leader, right? Mm -hmm. The way we talked about things today, um, how we, how we take leadership seriously, how we care about people. That's, that's what the essence of ANSO is, right? right? It's not just an, an organization, right? It's about a leadership style that enables us to find the best talent and make them better, better. right? So, and and of course, you know, bringing the sense of belonging because it's you know right. when you hear a little bit of reggaeton on the in the peeway, the peeway is what we call the the hallway on the ship, right? Mm-hmm. When you hear reggaeton through the P-Way, you feel a little bit better, right? At least I do. So um, you feel like, like, okay, so somebody like is is listening what I listen to, like my Hispanic music, right? Yeah, oh, you know, yeah, like, and, and yeah, give a you you have to be okay with that, and yeah. and you know that's why when 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 I go to the Anso symposiums, like I love it when we put the music on, right? Like especially when you're walking in, mm-hmm. and they have like side to side or something, and like the moment that happens. Especially the first time it happens for somebody, for me, that was a defining moment yeah. because I realized, okay, Anso, got it, military, right? But usually we're not trained to see a bunch of Latinos in uniform with music in the background, like with salsa or, or oh, Hispanic yes. music in the background. Like we're not used to that. It's So the first time you experience it, it's a it's a moment of belonging. It's like, hey, okay, all these different things in my life, my military service, my Hispanic culture, all of it has kind of converged, right? Okay, finally, it's all together, mm-hmm. right? Because other times it's it's like I'm in uniform, I'm in the military, right? Yeah. Or I'm Latino, I'm Hispanic, right? It's it's that's a time where like it jives it's perfectly. Like everything connects and merge. Right. In both the culture and aspect in our, our work. Now, definitely uh, answer mission is mentorship, right? It's so one of the central missions. And as we talk about mentorship, 
And for those listeners, what advice would you give to junior officers or those aspiring to, to leadership roles in the, within the military? Yeah. So I, um, so there's two things I'd offer. Uh, one I'm plagiarizing from Nathan King, that, uh, that officer that I, I mentioned, um, he's, he's retired as a, as a captain now, but, um, he used to tell us something called PPFF, right? And I've modified it since then, but um, personal, professional, family, fitness, right? So it's a quad, right? So we, for ourselves, but also for those we lead, we have to make sure that that your personal development, professional development, family and fitness are constantly being looked at that you're you're spending the appropriate amount of time on all those things right so what does that mean well personal is like you know you want to learn how to code just just to do it right you want to learn how to use ai um professional development is something like getting a getting a course that's going to advance um something within your career family is prioritizing uh your family, right? Uh, and then fitness is actually multifaceted. So it's not just physical fitness, but it's physical fitness, emotional fitness, mental fitness, and spiritual fitness, mm -hmm. and financial fitness, right? I include the financial piece there because that's another area that um, in working with um, We Are All Human Foundation and the Hispanic Star, They've shared a lot of information. And one of the areas that Hispanics within the United States struggle with is financial literacy. Right. Um, and so for me, I, I think that's a really important area that we as a community need to focus on mm -hmm. because you can do everything you do with the military and the military has some great ways to take care of your money. But if you don't leverage it, what, yeah. what use is yes, it? Yes, definitely. Uh, I was talking to one of my students yesterday, matter of fact, about this financial uh, literacy because I she was like, I want to do something else other than just collecting a paycheck. I mean, I want to diversify. I want to be able to buy properties. I want to be able to invest in other uh, venues, uh, financial venues. So, yeah, it most definitely has to be incorporating that membership. Yeah. So, um, so PPFF is one, right? And, and I could go off on tangents about all of that, but um, PPFF is one. The next thing I would say is there's really three, three things that we have to do as leaders, three things that we have to do as officers, right? Articulate vision, remove obstacles, create stability. So articulate vision, what is that? Well, from, you know, I just mentioned that, that uh, I met, you know, we listened to the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, right? But I also have a sailor that's just an E2 that's on my ship, right? And they're taking care of whatever it is they're taking care of. I need to be able to articulate the vision from the president of the United States which is defined by our national security strategy, national defense strategy, national military strategy. I need to be able to define all that, right? And make that understood down to the E2, mm -hmm. right? And everywhere in between. So whether that's a junior officer that's working for me or whether that's my captain, my job is to communicate all of that across up and down the chain of command, right. articulate vision. The next one is remove obstacles. What do I mean by that? Remove obstacles for your people to do their job, right? What I've noticed throughout my career is nine times out of 10, when somebody's not getting the job done, it's because something is in their way, right? Because the sailors we have are incredible. They're go-getters. They just get things done, right? So if they're not able to get something done, it's probably not because they're slacking, mm -hmm. right? Something's in their way, right? So one great example that I use is like, um, not meaning to hit on, on logistics intentionally here, but like <laughs> we have, we have the supply, supply guys on our ship, right? Well, um, in order to check out certain tools, 
right? Certain tools or paint would need to be checked out by these supply guys, mm -hmm. right? Because they, they have control of them. Well, when the supply people are only open from 11 to 3, right? And that means that you could have met, done quarters with your sailors at 7 or 8, but they have to wait three hours before they can do any maintenance because they can't get paint or they can't get tools, mm -hmm. right? That is an obstacle for your sailors to do their job. So one of the things I did was I talked to the supply officer. I was like, you got to change your hours because that's not going to work, right. right? Like my guys are hurting because no, they have to work point. around your schedule yeah. instead of – so, um, you know, we as officers, we have a responsibility to find what those – I mean, and that requires us to listen. Listen and try and figure out – what it is that's making it difficult for our people to do their job and then remove those obstacles for them. The last one is create stability. And what do I mean by that? Create stability in the midst of chaos, right? So um, every day is different in the military, right? Um, but you want to try and create some sense of normalcy, right? So like before I... Before I went to bed, when I was on the ship as chief engineer, before I went to bed, after I came off watch, I would stop by my engineering control room to see if they had anything else for me for the night. Mm -hmm. So they knew no matter what, I wasn't going to go to sleep without checking in with them, mm -hmm. right? So if something was happening and they, and nobody, and I hadn't told them I'm going to bed, they knew that I wouldn't see them. They also knew during the middle of the day, when I had the chance, during certain hours, I would walk around certain spaces right so if a sailor needed to talk to me one-on-one -on -one mm. and they didn't want to you know do get the chain of command involved they just wanted they knew that i was going to be around they could pull me to the side and just you, have that conversation. you know and um and so creating stability in whatever little way you can mm. i think is is something that you can offer your your people so that so that they can be more effective. So, so my leadership kind of lesson, right, is articulate vision, remove obstacles, create stability. So with those three plus PPFF, I think you can, you can do a pretty good job of leadership uh, in and around your, your circle. Appreciate it, sir, for those uh, words. Now, uh, you mentioned something like about uh, you being in, in ANSO Symposium. So we have the upcoming Western Region Leadership Symposium, which is a major event for ANSO. Yep. Um, what can attendees expect, expect of, the leader, of the symposium and why this event is so important for professional development? Yeah, I so I, I think whatever your expectations are, the symposium is definitely going to going to beat those expectations. Mm -hmm. Every symposium, every ANSO symposium I've ever gone to mm -hmm. has been better than what I thought it, the last one was. Mm -hmm. um, and it's always been better than what I thought it was going to be. My first ANSO symposium was in 2012. And I literally had a conversation about war fighting mm -hmm. with a three-star admiral. Oh. Right? Like, never... Never thought I could have that experience. Mm -hmm. um, another symposium in 2000, uh, another symposium in 2016, um, I had a captain look at my fitness reports and give me some advice that really helped me for my next job, right? Um, the speed mentoring has always been kind of like our signature thing because you get a real opportunity to sit down across the table from senior officers and senior enlisted and pick their brains about things that are bothering you. Mm -hmm. um, but the other piece there too is that moment that I talked to you about, that sense of belonging where you're That's like nice. within the community, mm -hmm. but also within, within the military. Mm -hmm. There's nothing that is quite as profound as, as that. Um, so one, you get mentoring, you get professional development. I think the one takeaway, and I'm sure, um, Colonel Montalvan will talk about it, but when you get to the answer symposium, you got to make sure you walk away with mentors and proteges. Um, 
And you want to try and find mentors and protégés within four different kind of roles, right? So you want a role model, somebody that you can look up to, right? You want a coach, somebody that can help you with a specific skill set or something that you're working on. You you need a mentor that can help guide you career-wise, right? And and give you advice on on pursuing certain things or working things out with certain people. And then you need an advocate. And the advocate is the person who grabs the phone, picks up the phone, calls somebody and says, hey, this person's really, really good at their job. Give them the opportunity, right? And so you need mentors that can do that for you. And you need protégés that you can be that for them, right? And if you do that, um, one, the symposium is going to be a really great moment for you, right? But two, you're actually contributing to that warfighting effectiveness that we talk about, right? Because you're, you're actually getting what you need to be more successful as a leader, but you're also helping others be more successful in their roles, which only helps the joint force. It only brings the rest of, a, rest of us up. I'm sure you've heard um, rising tides raise all boats, right? Mm-hmm. So that's what we, that's what we want at, with ANSO. We want mentors and protégés, and we want to make sure that we serve all four of those roles. Basically, what I think you need to do is you need to realize that every person you meet, regardless of where they are, mm-hmm whether they're junior to you, whether they're senior to you, whether they, they're in the military or not, everybody can offer you something, mm-hmm. right? And so when you look at an individual and you can figure out what role they serve for you, whether they are um, a role model or a coach, mm-hmm. um, when, when you leverage that, and by going to an answer symposium, you can do that. You can find somebody that can be a role model. You can find somebody that can be a mentor. You can find somebody that can be a coach. And they can help you in certain ways. Alternatively, you have to be the same thing for people there. All right, so you have to, to be able to actually not only get the mentorship from, by, from someone, but actually be the mentor for another person. Because right. like, it's like the the teach to the teacher method like uh, i'll teach you and then you'll teach after i teach you um right. and i think it is a bit important to not only uh, receive that mentorship by somebody but being a mentor by, um, f- uh, for someone um yeah so yeah so th- that's gonna happen on, on san diego coming up like december the 2nd to the 6th uh super excited to to be there there's there's gonna be a lot of stuff going on not only navy uh, Marine uh, and, 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 and Coast Guards. We're going to have uh, Air Force. We're going to have Army as well. I'll be joining them as well. Uh, I'll be there uh, doing some some interviews. So it's going to be a great, great experience on, on this uh, Western Region Relationship Symposium provided by Answer. So, so as the Answer election coming up, and I, as we look to the future, what is your vision for Answer and what, and what legacy do you hope to leave behind as by, Vice President? Yeah, um, I mean, I think we've done a lot uh, over the years, mm-hmm. uh, seven years as as a member of the board of directors. But you know, I'm not going anywhere. I'm just mm-hmm. I'm just changing changing Gross. roles here Gross. a little bit. Yeah. Um, but but the reality is, Anso, it's 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 kind of what I said earlier. Anso is more than just an organization. It's it's kind of like a commitment to leadership. And the style of leadership that you want Mm -hmm. to drive, right? And so what I think is important is we need to begin to try and do um, what I mentioned about trying to see how we can get a DOD-wide council or organization that's actually able to provide direct feedback. Mm -hmm. Um, we can do it, but we do it in a, in a kind of roundabout way. 
And because we're a non-federal entity, it puts us in a weird place. Mm. Um, you know, there's been times, don't get me, don't get me wrong. I'm not like, I'm not, um, I don't hold a grudge about this, but you know, there's certain JAGs, judge advocate generals that aren't really knowledgeable about ANSO. They don't know that we have a memorandum of understanding with the Navy and the Marine Corps and the Coast Guard. Um, and so, you know, they, they look at any event that a flag officer attends for us as sketchy, right? Not really sure about, right? But the reason that exists is because we are a non-federal entity, 501c3 nonprofit. As long as there's no, ANSO is going to continue to exist as long as there's no organization that does it within the services within the, right? okay. and within the DOD. As long as that doesn't exist, there's not a place for people who want to feel like they belong amongst like Latinos, right? So we need to continue to exist because, because the services aren't providing it for us. Right. But if DOD were to come together and say, hey, Army, Navy, Air Force, Let's Marine Corps, Coast Guard, we're, we should have a leader affinity group which, you know, some of the services are catching on, right? Like the Coast Guard has their women's policy group. The Navy just established one like that. So these are now within the services and that functions. It, it, does, its, it does its purpose. It's, right. it's building its, its purpose. Um, but I really do believe that, that where we need to go is just continue – to be contributors to the effort. Um, we've got to get out there, you know, when it comes to, um, I mentioned HISPA earlier, but like getting to middle schools, I'll, I'll share with you something that Admiral Dennis Velez said. So Admiral Dennis Velez, he's from Adjuntas Puerto Rico. I got to work with him or work for him um, when I was at Navy Recruiting Command. Um, He's now chief of staff to U.S. Cyber Command, which is super cool. Mm -hmm. um, but when we were in recruiting command, one of the things he said is, we get our enlisted folks in high school. We get our officers in middle school. What, what that says to me is the things that HISPA does going to elementary and middle school, mm -hmm. where we have an opportunity to go talk to those students and talk to them about our military service and all that. That's how we get somebody connected so right. that they can go apply to the Naval Academy, so they can get an NROTC scholarship. So they're not enlisting and then finding another way, another path to become officers. And why is that relevant? Because the difference between commissioning at 48, sorry, between commissioning at 22, 23, and commissioning at 26, 27 is the difference between 48 and 52 when right. you're going up for flag or general officer, mm -hmm. right? And 48 and 52, those do have a little bit, like it's four years, but the four years at that age make a difference. Kids, Kids yeah. where, you know, where they're going to college, whether they're going to college or, um, you know, medical stuff, mm -hmm. things are a little you know, might be harder for you to stay in. And so what we need to do is we need, we need to drive a lot more of the Hispanic community to enter via service academy and NROTC earlier, right? Mm -hmm. So that they get into the process quickly, quickly, yeah. so that we can then 25 years from now have more sitting as captains to be selected for flag. Mm -hmm. Right now, Hispanics, I think the last numbers I saw was like 3% wow. for 06 in the Navy, Hispanic. Yeah. Like, that's it's, that's not good. It's very low, low threshold. Like, yeah. And let's go back to the age. And uh, I'm, I'm one of those uh, percentages because I entered, uh, I commissioned at the age of 27th. So when I retire, I mean, my 20 years mark is going to be what, uh, 47, 48. So that's when I reach my lieutenant colonel, maybe to to get captain. And going back to your to words, it's like, yeah, 48 versus 52 is a huge gap. It's not only four years. 
Uh, there's more than that if only four it years. Is, it is when it's 22 <laughs> and 27, right? Yeah. It's only four years there, but yeah. it's, but it's, but over time. And, and, and that's the thing that's, that's the thing that's also important. So, um, what I, what I've learned in my time with Anso is just how nuanced some of these things are, mm -hmm. right? Like one of the other things that happens is our communities, right? Surface warfare community, my community, submarine community, aviation community, they own the vast majority of the problem, mm -hmm. the communities themselves, the, the, um, when the cultures of those war fighting communities are not right, what that does is it pushes people out of those communities and into other communities, which is okay. As long as we don't lose them, I don't want to lose them. I don't want to lose them from the Navy or the Marines or the army. But now they're less competitive for flag. Mm, right. They're less competitive for general. Yeah, right. So like if you're, if you're not a, if you're an HR officer, there's only one HR officer that's a flag officer mm -hmm. in the Navy. There's like 200 that are unrestricted line officers. Yeah. So there's, you know, foreign affairs, human resources, intel. All those are great communities, right? All great communities. But to get to flag and general officer, you got to be in – like those combat arm communities. Right. And so right. what happens with me is like when I meet a surface warfare officer that's lieutenant or below, right? My focus is, hey, what is it you need so that you stay in our community? Because I want you to stay in the community. Because not only not only is that important for them to become flag and general officers, but there's a lot of Hispanic sailors that are on those ships that need a captain mm -hmm. who's of Hispanic descent because that's the role model that they can look up to, Right. Right. But if they don't see that, what are they going to do? They're going to get out after their right, first four years, right? right? Or, or they're not going to pursue officer opportunities. Mm -hmm. Or they're not going to pursue trying to be a command master chief mm -hmm. because they don't see the leaders that they um, – they don't see the leaders around them that, that, that are uh, – that they want to emulate. Right. So I think, I think what, we, what we need to do – at ANSO is we need to do a good job of educating our own Latinos in uniform uh, of the contributions that we've had. Like, I don't know if you know this as an army officer, but the first admiral in the history of the U.S. Navy was Hispanic. Mm. Uh, David Faragut, his father was a Spanish merchantman, okay. right? But he was the first admiral in the U.S. Navy. Mm right? Crazy, right? Um, and, you know, we, we need to do a much, much better job of telling our story within the services. But then we also need to do a better job of finding out where our pitfalls are. So I mentioned, I mentioned age is one, right? The next thing is the the routes, right? So two thirds of all Hispanics in the country that are going to undergraduate education mm. attend Hispanic serving institutions, but we only have a few NROTC units at Hispanic serving institutions, right? right? And they're not even at the biggest ones, mm. right? Um, so we've, we've got to focus on that. We've got to get the story down to, to, you know, middle school, right? Expose those students to the the opportunities and then give them guidance. Hey, if this is something you want, you got to take, you know, physics and chemistry and calculus when you're in high school, right? I saw a guy who was applying from my high school not long ago um, for a service academy and he didn't take those courses. Well, then you're not going to get an opportunity. Mm. They're just, yeah. it's kind of like you either have it or you don't, yeah. right? And we've got to get that information down to our community so that they know. They can, they know it. They can actually take it. Yeah. So they have the the opportunity. Precisely. So I think I think um, so. There's there's that, and um, you know, the last the last piece that I think is key is 
we need to do more of preparing our families to understand military service. Mm-hmm. Um, and we need to do that early. So we, we've got to make sure that our, our parents, our grandparents they know. are, yeah, we, we need to make sure that we communicate what it's like and, and why, um, you know, we might struggle. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, and then, I mentioned financial literacy, you know, I, I wish I could give a, a roadmap to every, mm-hmm. every Hispanic, Hispanic so they sailor, have, yeah. Marine, you know, make yeah. sure you put your money in TSP, make TSP, sure you put yeah. the right, so, you know, don't leave it in G the whole time. Yeah. Um, so, and, and then leverage your VA loan cause it's a great deal. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, we've got, we've got a lot more to do. Um, but again, you know, People talk about wokeness and all that. This isn't a DEI thing, right? This is about creating a sense of belonging within the military services, which is what everybody wants. And by doing that, we're empowering our joint force to be a more capable warfighting team, right? right? And by doing that, we're now creating a meritocracy where the real best talent rises to the top because everybody's getting a fair shot at mentoring and professional development. So that's that's what ANSO is all about. That's where we need to keep going. I'm really excited about the efforts that have been put on, the fact that we have leaders like you that are helping to get the story out. Like we're in a really, really great place. And, you know, it sucks, it sucks that I'm not gonna be <laughs> vice president much longer, but um, you know, I'm I, you know, I'm really proud to have been part of of the board of directors for so long. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and so ain't stopping anytime soon, right? We we are going to keep moving forward, and I'm I'm excited to see where we keep going. And I'll, you know, I'm still going to be around. It's not like yeah, you can't just give up on Anso, yeah, yeah. right? Like it's been part of me for a long time. Now, uh, as we're wrapping up this conversation, it's been fun. It's been uh, a lot of knowledge and mentorship, sir. So Appreciate it uh, for you to drive it down from Quantico all the way here to my house uh, to get this um, and. First time I do it like in a setting like this, uh, my house actually. Uh, I, I hope you enjoy it. You feel well, comfortable. <laughs> let me just say, I don't know which camera is on right now, but but um, uh, that one with the red. So so let me say that the setup he's got here. This is like super professional over here. Okay, <laughs> so you keep doing what you're doing, man. I, I you know I know that uh, one. This is really impactful, but the fact that you take it so seriously make it so professional and and i feel very well one it was great to have a conversation with you before and and, you know i know that i've gotten a lot out of this conversation too so um yeah so i was like appreciate it sir uh as we wrap it up and again i appreciate your kind words it it was fun to have you here today in my house and and, and having this conversation face to face instead of being virtual because like most of my conversation are virtual just the fact like COVID came and they changed yeah. a lot of the landscape and yeah. Zoom is one of them. And that is why I'm able to, especially I have, I have done my interviews with people in Japan, right? In Okinawa. It was crazy, yeah. right? Um, with, with, uh, Sandoval. Yeah. 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 So, but, uh, again, I appreciate it to, to drive all the way here and do this face to face. Last question I have to close this conversation. Uh, what key, key message or call to action would you like to share with your with our audience today uh, before we wrap up, wrap up this conversation? Call to action. So number one, if you're not scheduled to go to an ANSO symposium, go to the ANSO symposium. The first one you can go to, go to it. Um, and second, Find someone that you can help develop and find somebody that can help develop you. And if you do that, you're going to be contributing to ANSO no matter what. Um, if you're interested in looking at the military, hit us up on the website, mm-hmm. send a note to our to our team. Mm-hmm. Um, info at ansomil.org is, goes to a, a group of us. And, you know, we're happy to help anybody who's in any phase where they feel like they might need ANSO, right? So we've had people who um, were interested in, in joining the military, 
We've had people uh, who were clearly part of, um, you know, dealing with something within their command and they didn't know how to, how to manage it. Uh, you know, we, we've had a whole gambit of different requests over, over the years. If you feel like you don't have someone to go to, right. Send us a note. Mm -hmm. And, and if there's anything we can do to help you, we will, we're, yes, you know, we're a nonprofit 501 C three nonprofit. We're also all volunteer. No, none of us gets paid. Mm -hmm. Um, so like there's nothing there, there's nothing that, that we're going to have an ulterior motive against you about. Um, the one thing that I say is because we're all volunteers, sometimes it takes us a little bit of time to get back, but at punto, right? We care about nuestra familia mm -hmm. within the service, wearing the uniform. And so if there's anything we can do to support you, don't hesitate. If you feel like you don't have somebody to go to, send us a note. Um, yep. I mean, anything, whatever it is, right? Well, sir, appreciate it for today's uh, time. And again, the driving from all the way from Canonico here to have this great conversation. Um, and again, thank you for, for being today in the ANSA podcast. Thank you, Manuel. Thank you to Commander Machado for sharing uh, your, your inspiring journey and insight with us today. It has been a privilege to learn from your experience and hear about the impactful work and ANSA is, is doing under your leadership. Uh, before we, ra we wrap up, a reminder for our listeners, uh, the episode was brought to you by Navy Mutual, supporting the financial well-being uh, of our military families. Don't forget to mark your calendars for the Western Region Leadership uh, Symposium happening December 2, to, uh, the 2nd to the 6th, 2024 at MCAS Miramar in San Diego. Uh, it can be, it can miss, I cannot miss this event for anyone looking to grow as a leader and connect with professional in the Naval Services and beyond. Visit AnswerMail.org for more details. Follow Answer on social media at AnswerMail to stay updated on future events and initiatives and as always subscribe to the answer podcast on youtube and spotify to catch all, all our upcoming episodes uh until next time this is captain manuel calo thank you for listening and stay inspired let's go mi gente, mi gente. <laughs>